an underwater photographer, unlike a wildlife photographer on land, doesn't have the luxury of um, sitting in a camouflage blind and waiting for a month uh, for some elusive animal to wander past and use a, a 600 millimeter telephoto lens. You have to get very close to your subject, usually within a few meters. And what that means is, you know, you're going to do all the research. I'm working with scientists who can tell you the best time of year to be in a place and, you know, what to do and so forth. But at the end of the day, the whale has to let you into its world. This project, I mean, you've done so many projects, but this project about the whales, how did you get onto this? Uh, you know, it was, um, it was probably a 10 year sort of process where I had done a, a big story for National Geographic about the most endangered whale in the world, uh, the Northern right whale, North Atlantic right whale. Right. Since that time, I wanted to do a multi-species story and the challenge for me was coming up with the narrative. So I was reading a lot of scientific papers, talking to researcher friends, and I noticed this theme of culture, of whale culture emerging in a lot of the latest and greatest science. The fact that like humans, whales are doing things differently within a genetically identical species. So um, the more I learned about that, I thought it was really a game changer. So I, I proposed it uh, originally to National Geographic Magazine, and then I sold it to TV as a series where it got ramped up to Disney, and then I wrote a book about it. I mean, you've obviously been in the ocean a long time, huh? Did yeah. You, did you start in the ocean as a kid? Like, what got you in there? I grew up in Massachusetts, and, um, you know, my parents would take me to the beaches of Cape Cod or Rhode Island, and I fell in love with the sea as a child. I initially, just wanted to be an ocean explorer. I started scuba diving when I was about 15 years old. And then it was a year or two later that I discovered photography was the way I wanted to explore the ocean with a camera and tell stories. Very lofty dream. You know, I came from this little working class blue collar mill town, a textile mill town, didn't know anybody who did anything like that. Yeah. But, you know, sort of chipped away at it, figured it out. My dream was always National Geographic. It eventually happened. And, you know, 23 years later, I'm working on my 29th story, but I'm also moving much more into film. I, I went to college for television and film production. So kind of returning to my roots a little bit more these days. It's funny, you know, National Geographic, Jesse, over the many years we've worked together, will always think of that as the sort of the gold standard, if you will, of, you yeah. know, why, and we, we all grew up with it. I'm sure that some of the folks watching this won't even, maybe never even seen it. So why was that? Really? I think everybody's seen National Geographic. No, I mean, we know it as a TV, we know it as, people might know it as a, as a content, but mm -hmm. the actual magazine as well, right? So yeah. was that where... Was that I mean, did you grow up with that as a kid? I, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, it was always the gold standard. I mean, as a kid, you know, I was watching Cousteau documentaries on PBS, mm -hmm. some of which were National Geographic films. And I was reading the magazine on the living room floor and it was a way to escape. It was a way to, to, to travel to exotic places and, you know, see these, these underwater images of, of things that really spoke to my soul. But and, it, wasn't um, just, it wasn't just underwater images, it was images all over the world, like things. It, that's right. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I grew up in the 1960s and I was inspired by NASA and, you know, mm -hmm. I thought I would have loved to have been an astronaut, but there was definitely something about the ocean, you know, as a wild, wanting to be a wildlife photographer, an ocean photographer, I sort of saw the, the guys that were working at National Geographic as, as the people on Mount Olympus, they were mm -hmm. the ones who were really the top of the game. So if you're going to get into that business, that was the thing to now, aspire do you, to. Do you remember your first dive with one of them? I, you know, became a certified diver. I was doing photography, went to college and studied film and photojournalism. I was working for dive magazines, selling stock, doing speaking engagements, all of that. And I gotten to know um, some of the National Geographic photographers. There were essentially three primary underwater photographers working, you know, in the 1970s, 80s, 90s at Geographic. There was David Dubelay, there was uh, Bill Kurtzinger and Flip Nicklin you know, they didn't seem to be moving on anytime soon. They were pretty right. well fixed. And um, I, I ultimately became friendly with uh, all of them, one or two in particular. And um, the first dives I made were with Bill Kritzinger, who lived in Maine. He was a New England guy. I was living in Massachusetts. He was a guy whose work really, really spoke to me. He was the first guy to ever photograph a, a large whale underwater. He was a Navy mm -hmm. photographer originally. And he was doing stuff under ice, polar ice, Antarctica, Arctic, um, big marine mammals, 
um, shipwrecks, things that weren't. Now, so now was that your first dive with him, Antarctica or someplace like that? No, we actually, um, we dove in Maine, believe it or not. Um, okay, so I, you're diving oh, in, you're diving in water. Maine, you're, you're, you're diving in Maine, and it's kind of your backyard, right? Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it's pretty comfortable, right? Yes. Like, you're, there's nothing, you know, 25 feet, you know, like yeah. not too, not yeah. too, you know, and there's some beautiful things, right? How oh, yeah. soon before you're going to Antarctica, like, and you're well, jumping off a boat with nothing around you, you know, yeah. except yourself, you know what I mean? A couple of points to that question. I didn't have the resources to travel myself in the early days. So I started diving in 1977, 78. I didn't take my first dive trip on my own until 1986. I went to Florida and thought, you know, I was going to New Zealand or something. I mean, it was a big deal for me. With guys like Bill Kurtzinger, we were doing it as friends, not as an official assignment. So that would have been in the mid nineties or so. And we, we did a trip to Australia together. We right. did great white sharks and whale sharks and so forth. Then I got my first assignment for National Geographic myself in 98. And over the last 23 years, I've worked all, you know, all over the world. But, but do you remember like your first trip to Antarctica or to oh, yeah. someplace? And, and what was it? Was it like, wow, Oh. I am a long way from Maine now. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And those, you know, the, those long trips, I mean, those big, long distant trips were assignments for National Geographic. And, you know, it's always the greatest day of your life is when you get the assignment. I propose a story. They were my ideas. I write a proposal. I propose it. If they give me the green light, that's fantastic. Then you wake up the next morning and it's like, oh no, what did I do? You know, now I have yeah. to deliver the goods. Yeah. So that was the, the, always the stress. So you're in these exotic places, you know, you've got a crew working for you, you've hired a boat or a helicopter and, you know, you've got all this stuff, but man, the, the stress is real. It's, it, you feel it. It's like, I have to come back with the, the, the great images, you know? So, but, but before that, you've dove in Maine for years. You went to yeah. Florida, which is, you know, like I could dive in Florida, right? Like, yeah, you yeah. know, but it's like, you know, it's like, yeah, well, no, no. I mean, it's side you don't know of me, Priscilla. I could actually okay, dive in okay, Florida. Okay. Maybe not very deep, but I could do it. There you um, go. Uh, but I couldn't dive in Antarctica. Yeah. So, so you know, what's the mindset, even before you're going to take a picture, Right. what's your mindset when you're getting off that boat? You haven't been there before. Mm. And, and it's like you're going into the darkness and you don't know what's down there. How are you thinking about that when you first get to that remote place? It's a really great question. You know, nobody's ever asked that before. Um, I think, you know, it's a mix of, of a little bit of being a little terrified. You know, it's like, oh my goodness, you know, what have I got myself into? But there's also this great desire to, to, to explore. I mean, that's a big part of the, the reason why I'm doing this. I'm inspired to explore. And you, you just want to get in and start getting comfortable in an environment. You know, I, I often say that wherever I am in the world, whether it's a, the polar regions or a tropical coral reef in the middle of the South Pacific, when I first get in the water, what I usually see is chaos. I, I don't really understand what I'm looking at. And the, the way that I make order out of chaos is I begin to, to zero in at on one thing at a time, you know, photographically, I start to photograph one little fish or one little animal and, and its behavior. And then I sort of broaden the, the scope and, and all of a sudden things begin to make sense. But that might take, you know, several dives, several days, a week more. Um, but in some of those really remote places, um, you know, I think you're just always super jacked up, a, a, a combination of adrenaline and stress and, and just all of those things are playing into it. The more you do it, you know, you, you get better, but it never goes away. I mean, you're always nervous. I, I remember here reading an interview with Steven Spielberg and well, years into his career, where he said that on the first day of a, of a new film project, he inevitably has to pull over his car on the side of the road and throw up because he still still gets nervous. And I, I could totally identify with that, you know. Now, some of these animals have very, very long migration patterns. Mm -hmm. So you might see an animal, a shark in, in Hawaii, but then find out, you know, it goes all the way to New Zealand. I'm making that up because but sure. I know their patterns are really long. Yeah. So when you see them in some other place, is it like, okay, I know this animal. I feel a kinship with this. Even though I'm somewhere far away, I this is familiar to me. I haven't had that experience. You're absolutely right. The animals do migrate. It is very possible to see the same animal. 
Um, the only time where I might have even had an opportunity to do that would be with whales, like humpback whales that would spend the winter in Hawaii, like Maui, and then the summer in Alaska, the same animals you would see in both places. Although I've spent an abundant time in both places, I don't know that I've seen the same animal. Researchers do, for sure, but no, I, I haven't really quite had that happen. Let's talk about the whales, though, because, you know, the whales, they just represent so much such mythology, yeah. human history. And what, you know, why did you want to take that on? I mean, it's a pretty daunting assignment. And to think that. To and try what does to it feel like down there with these animals? I mean, they're so well, huge. Even you know? before you go down there with them, what do you want to know about them? Like we ascribe so many characteristics to whales and, and you know, in the preview of your story, like they mourn like they live like us. Yeah. How do we, are we, do we, are we making that up? Are we just trying to need to make that up to make human beings feel akin? What is going on there? For context, I would say this, that, you know, so much of my work over the years, and I think many of the documentary films we've seen over the generations tend to be what I would call clinical or, you know, looking at, at nature from the 35,000 foot view. And we are sort of above it and apart from it. And we're looking at it as if it's under a microscope and, oh, that's all great and wonderful. The, the difference for me with Secrets of the Whales was, you know, there's been this trajectory in my career. When I first started, I guess like most photographers, I just wanted to make beautiful pictures of things that interested me. Then I began to see a lot of problems occurring in our world's oceans that I didn't think were apparent to most people. So a lot of my work began to focus on environmental issues and looking for solutions and so forth in the ocean. With, with Secrets of the Whales, I was interested in doing a multi-species whale story. The challenge, as I said, was the narrative. How did I connect the dots? And when I learned that some of the latest and greatest science was about the fact that they have culture, this to me was a game changer. The first thing I heard, I talked to a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Shane Garrow. He's a Canadian whale biologist who for the last 15 years has been studying sperm whales in the waters off of Dominica in the Caribbean, the Eastern Caribbean. And he had been able to do what nobody had done before. And that was, he identified about two dozen whale families, sperm whale families that he said were all speaking the same language, the same dialect. And he said that because of that, they belonged to what he called a clan and that they were not intermingling with other sperm whales that moved into those waters that spoke another language. So he said the first thing they do when they meet another whale in the, in the middle of the ocean is they say, I am from Dominica. And if the other whale says, I am from Haiti or someplace, they just casually go their own way. So I was imagining the neighborhoods of New York at the turn of the 20th century, where you had the Irish and the Italians and all these yeah. different groups. And I said, that's remarkable. And then I looked at humpback whales and I learned that they are having singing competitions every year and that beluga whales give their babies the same name as the mom until the beluga starts speaking proper beluga speak and then they get their own name and orcas have a preference for ethnic foods. In New Zealand they like uh, stingrays and in Patagonia they like seal pups. The same exact species but they're doing things very differently like humans. Right. So I said you know to me this was not an overtly conservation story. It was a, about cool science revealing these uh, human-like traits in, in, in these charismatic animals. But in many ways, it might be the most powerful conservation story because if we can see the ocean or our planet through the lens of culture with another species, mm -hmm. that might change our relationship to nature, which is essential for us to protect this planet, you know? How did Jim Cameron get involved with this project? Well, Jim is a, a National Geographic Explorer in residence at the Society. So I, I had known Jim, we had met a number of times over the years. We hadn't previously worked together, but um, I guess somebody told him about the project, he became especially interested, you know, and having him serve as executive producer was fantastic because he's this master storyteller, but also a great ocean explorer. So at, as, at EP level, he could really shape the narrative as well. And so you got to photograph these whales. Yeah. What's that like? What's it like? You know, I, I got to get a little further from this whale to get the shot. You know, I mean, it's like, yeah. It's like it's like trying to photograph a moving bus or something, you know? It's, it, like, it's a good description. Yeah. You know. One of the things that I think is is important to, to recognize is that an underwater photographer, unlike a wildlife photographer on land, doesn't have the luxury of um, sitting in a camouflage blind and waiting for a month uh, for some elusive animal to wander past and use a, a 600 millimeter telephoto lens. Right. Even, in, even in the clearest of water, you have to get very close to your subject, usually within a few meters. Um, you know, with a shark, you want them right on your dome port. So uh, with whales, 
you have to get close. And what that means is, you know, you're going to do all the research. I'm working with scientists who can tell you the best time of year to be in a place and, you know, what to do and so forth. But at the end of the day, the whale has to let you into its world. So, you know, you get in the water. I'm not using scuba in most cases. Um, again, with other photography, I would be using scuba, but with whales, the, the bubbles would scare the whales perhaps. Mm. And, you know, having a 50 pound tank and a weight belt and all of that would slow me down if the whales were even moving relatively slowly. So being nimble, I try to be very Zen-like with, um, with just a mass snorkel and fins and a wetsuit and breath hole wow. dive. So how are you breathing? You, you don't, you're holding your breath. So you might only have two or three minutes if you can hold your breath that long with a whale and then you have to come back up, get a breath of air and then go back down. So the photography is challenging to say the least. I mean, do you yeah. feel insignificant down there? And when you swim up to its eye, like what's it, <laughs> what's it, what are you seeing in there? What's yeah. it seeing to you, you know? You know, with those big whales, a humpback or something like that, yeah, they could be, you know, 50 feet long and, and 50 or 60 tons. So you do feel sort of very humbled and, and insignificant there's an awareness, you know, these, you're never going to sneak up on a whale. They know you're there and they're choosing to allow you close. And sometimes they're kind of indifferent. Other times they actually engage with you. And when you've got this big brained animal that is operating on a very high level, high degree of cognition, and they're choosing to interact with you, it's unlike anything else. I mean, it's like being with an alien species, a highly intellectual alien species in an alien realm, the ocean, um, that's, you know, not, I won't say communicating with you, but certainly there's some sort of nonverbal communication going on. You know, you know that unlike other animals, perhaps, they are really thinking. They have big brains. The sperm whale, for example, has the largest brain of any animal on earth. They are highly social. They're highly um, shy and curious and uh, playful with each other. Um, they reaffirm their family bonds every day. They come together, even though life is tough in the ocean, they're diving deep all day long for food. And then they come together and they just rub each other. And if you're part of that, if you're in there, you know, they're checking you out They're you know, looking at you and it, it, it speaks to you, I think on a, on a unique level. You know, how do they, how do they let you know you're there? Like, how do you communicate with them? How do you get their trust? You know, do you then kind of swim along with them? I mean, what's that process mm. of also to get their trust? Whether or not this is, this works, it, it's what I try to do. And it doesn't always work for me, but, you know, again, so I'm free diving, right? So if I see, let's say I see a mother and humpback whale calf in a little cove in, in Tonga in the South Pacific one morning. So I'll get maybe 150 feet away, maybe 50 meters away. And we stop the boat and we just sit there for a while and we just kind of watch them, you know, if they're up on the surface breathing or maybe the mom is resting 20 feet down and the calf is playing up on the surface over her head. So we just observe for a while, make sure everything is cool and they're just kind of staying there. And then I'll just put my mass snorkel and fins on, grab my camera and I slide into the water and I try to be very quiet. You don't want to splash. You don't want to make any noise. You know, you want to be respectful. And then I move in very, very slowly just to the edge of visibility where I can see them underwater. If the vis is really good, you know, that might be 100 feet away or 80 feet away. By then, they usually know that I'm there. So I just stay there for a while, kind of hanging out at the edge of visibility, maybe swim around a little bit, let them know I'm there. Sometimes they'll, they'll move. Sometimes they stay. If they stay over a period of time, I'll move a bit closer and a bit closer, but in a very non-threatening way. And I try to make a conscious effort to even slow my my heart rate down. You know, I'm I'm breathing. I'm doing a little you know Zen breathing, a little meditation breathing. I'm I'm trying to think of something else. I'm you know not about getting the picture. Um, and then over time, you know, get closer and see how they behave. I'll move you know sort of in in front so the mom can see me. I don't want to come behind her. You know, swim up behind her tail and and surprise her or anything. I want I want her to know I'm there. And you know, some moms are very tolerant, they're very relaxed, and they do allow you into the world. As Jesse said, you know, even though I have to get close, I don't want to get super close because then I can't get a picture. So, you know, I'm thinking about where the light is. I'm thinking about is the, is the sun behind my back so that the whale is, is going to be lit. Um, you know, I want to move into a position to make a nice frame. And then depending how much time they give you, you know, you just kind of work it. But at some point, they may just stay for hours and then you go back to the boat and have a cup of coffee or they they will just move on. And then I just back <laughs> off and say, OK, you know, we'll try another day. When you're with these whales and you know that that 
so much is unknowable about them you know how much how mysterious does the whole thing feel you know like as you're doing it and i think this is why we titled the whole project secrets of the whales because they're, they're not secrets to them, but they're secrets to us because we just don't get that opportunity. If you spend enough time, you know, obviously the researchers who, who spend their lives doing this, things will be revealed. You know, you get to see these moments. With each experience, you begin to connect the dots a little bit more. Um, the more time you spend, if you spend this time with the same animals, if you're lucky to be able to do that, then you really get to see personality. You know, you see that some are a little bit more um, playful or a little bit shy or a little more frisky or curious or and they just like people they have these behaviors that that you can identify you know with um, Jacques Cousteau and then all the way up to Sylvia Earle are we making mm. uh, inroads making inroads are we are we stemming the flow are you an optimist for the future of this I'm cautiously optimistic uh, you know, I did a, a story, a, a cover story, actually this, this cover here on, on saving Amer uh, the ocean's bounty. It was about the global fisheries crisis in 2007. And I did a separate story in that issue about the value of marine protected areas, about setting aside places in the ocean. Most scientists would say that we need 30 to 40% of the world's oceans to be protected to have a healthy future. At the time I did that story, there was only about 1% of the ocean. Today, depending how you gauge it where maybe five to six to seven percent. So we're still a long way away from 40. We have made inroads. Um, and I think, you know, more people are aware of it. More people would vote for, you know, for conservation in the ocean today than, than they would have in the in the past. But it's a race against time. You know, that window of opportunity is closing. Those national parks that Obama made, you know, yes. what are what are those ones like now? Are they have the species rebounded there? They have. Um, so in the, in the last year of his administration, in 2016, um, I was working with Obama's ad administration because the idea of using 2016, which was the centennial anniversary of the US National Park Service, using that as an opportunity to look to the next century, the, the blue centennial, to protect America's oceans, was discussed with him and he loved the idea and, and was planning, we think, to use the Antiquities Act, which presidents can do to create protected places. So it wouldn't be a national park per se, it was going to be a national marine monument. So he ended up creating the largest one in the world in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands by expanding the boundaries of a previously existing one that George W. Bush created. And I actually went there the day before with Sylvia um, to photograph him. And then he invited me to go snorkeling with him. So I spent a couple hours making the first pictures. Since he's pretty good at he's pretty good with a scuba gear, yeah. He's very good. We were we were free diving, and I had a hard time keeping up with him. He's a hell of a swimmer. But um, in just the four years or five years now since he did that, the species have rebounded, and and they're showing. There's scientific papers that have been published that show that the economic benefit to fishermen has actually grown as well since that time. He also created one, the the first one in the Atlantic. It's the New England Seamounts and Canyons, which was reversed about a year or so ago by Trump, um, but now it's been reversed back by Biden. So, um, but that's a deep ocean one. It's a little harder to study, but these are like fragile China closets. You know, a single trawl net could go through and destroy it for generations. So thank goodness it's, it's back to being protected. What is the lesson of the sea? What is the lesson of the whale? You know, I think what I would want to do to everybody that I could in the world, you know, um, is to do two things, is to show them, remind them of the pictures that we've seen from NASA, from of Earth from space. You know, I've, I often get asked, what do I think is the most important photo ever made in the history of photography? And while I would like to pick one of my own, what I actually say is, you know, that photo that was made by Apollo 8 on in 1968 um, by the NASA astronauts of Earth rise, you know, of Earth rising with the moon in the foreground. Because when we saw those pictures, we saw instantly, I think, two things. One, that we live on this beautiful blue jewel out in the darkness of space, but that we also very much live on a water planet. And even though we are terrestrial creatures and we see our world from that terrestrial centric viewpoint, if you look at it from afar, you see that not only three quarters of the Earth's surface is ocean, but you, you understand that 98% of the biosphere, 98% of where life can exist on Earth is ocean. And then take people into the sea, as you said, Priscilla, and show them even one place, a coral reef, you know, and you see 
the, the biodiversity, you see that everything is connected. I often describe it as, you know, nature is like the gears of a finely made Swiss watch where the little gears are spinning faster and the big ones are spinning slower, but it's all meshed together. And when we begin to, to take parts of that machine apart, it breaks down. And, and I think for so long, human beings have seen themselves apart from nature or above it. And we need to see ourselves intimately connected to it on this ocean planet. Uh, I think it was Buckminster Fuller in the 1970s who said, we live on spaceship Earth, you know, no chance of resupply. So those are the messages that I think are most important. And we can get through that with science and with storytelling. But if I had a wish and could take everybody into space and then down into the ocean, that would be it. If we do a good job of, of preserving the biodiversity that remains, or at least big pockets of it, um, and that researchers are given the opportunity, we will learn uh, the lion's share in time. You know, I think technology is getting better. You know, even just in my own career, my own work, cameras are getting smaller and we can shoot in lower light and we can go deeper and we can shoot both video and stills on, on these things. So, you know, tagging is getting better. Scientists can tag an animal with a little mini camera and they can gather all this data. And, you know, we begin to do the three-dimensional chess game. We start to think about not only what are the leatherback sea turtles are doing, but what are the bluefin tuna doing? And what are the whales doing? And what are the seals doing? And then how does it all interrelate? What are they doing in relation to each other? And these are complex equations, but, you know, in time we can chip away at it and we can figure it out and hopefully understand our own relationship to that and how to better preserve it. You know, I think that's, that's the game changer that we need to uh, figure out. Well, Brian, thank you so much for sharing all this information. You know, it was a wonderful conversation. Everyone, please watch the new series, Secrets of the Whales, which is, I think, on Disney Plus, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, um, but, you know, you're just doing incredible things for all of us and um, so inspiring. The work is beautiful and moving. Yeah. Thanks, Priscilla. Thanks, Jesse. I'm, I'm yeah. really grateful. This was fun.